as well. Now, Colm, good morning to you. Morning, sir. Morning, Owen. Justice is done. Justice is done. Uh, Djokovic didn't win. Nadal smashed him. I mean, look, fair play. I'm delighted for him. Couldn't happen to a, a nicer uh, anti-vaxxer slash COVID spreader. No, let's stop this, though. Let's stop that. Novak Djokovic, first of all, more than played his part in this final. So despite the score, 6-love, six 6-2, six 7-5. Sounds very straightforward. Sounds like a typical first-round win for Nadal at the French Open. It was anything but. So regardless of what you think of Djokovic off the court, which is fair enough if you have that opinion of him, he contributed to uh, a very, very good final. All the better. All which, the better. But I have to say, Jar, more than anything, right, I have to point this out. The first set, as I say, finished 6-love. It took over 45 minutes, the first set. Djokovic, I'm not joking, probably played the better tennis. But that's how impenetrable Nadal was at the back of the court. And Djokovic was laughing incredulously at how good Nadal was. And despite all the talent coming through on the men's side, and there are a lot of, there are a lot of very good players that are emerging now, that it, it, it is... Um, reassuring for tennis fans that there is a generation coming through. For all of that, these two guys, Djokovic and Nadal, in their mid-30s, are still by far and away better than anybody else playing at the moment. And it was a brilliant match to watch, despite the scoreline. It really was. All, all the better, I say, for, uh, for Djokovic being beaten and... Um... For some form of justice being done. But look, look again, we always, this is great because we were having the conversation earlier on about uh, LeBron versus MJ. They're now level at the very top, uh, Nadal and Federer. Yeah. And I guess because Federer, um, I don't know, uh, how do you split them? Like, what, what are your criteria for splitting them? Um, I like, see, I would um, veer towards Federer because he spread out his Grand Slams among the four that you can win. Now, Federer's only won the French Open once. Yeah, so not much, nine. not much spreading out, but, really. But no, but the other three, he's won a number of times, whereas 13 of the 20 grandstands for Nadal is the French Open. So he's, Nadal has only won the Australian Open once. Uh, that was 11 years ago. He's only won Wimbledon twice, and the last time he won Wimbledon was 2010. So it's only the US Open he's won uh, more recently. He won, he won the US Open last year, for example, against Daniel Medvedev in the final. But it's really the French Open. Now, what you could say about Nadal is that Rafael Nadal is the best sports person ever at what he is particularly great at, which is his dominance on clay. He is untouchable. And we've had this conversation a lot, over, especially over the last month with the, the two Grand Slams back-to-back, the US Open and Roland Garros, is that you know the big three, and especially Djokovic and Federer, or sorry, Djokovic and Nadal, are so far ahead of everybody else. But what you saw on Sunday was that Nadal is so, so far ahead of Djokovic on clay as well. So it's not like the big three make it dull because they're just too good for anybody else and nobody else can come through. When each of them are at their best on their day and the other isn't quite at their best, they will dominate the alternative player. And that's exactly what happened between Nadal and Djokovic yesterday. Even though Djokovic played really, really well, he actually hit more winners than Nadal in the first set. The problem with Djokovic was that he didn't get on the scoreboard until 56 minutes into the match because Nadal just was not missing shots. By 6-love, 5-1, Nadal had hit three unforced errors. Three. Nadal, or sorry, Djokovic had hit about 30. So the problem with when you're facing Nadal, and it's why it's impossible to beat him on clay, is that when he's playing that well, you have to try something else. Your hand is forced. So Djokovic was playing tennis that he normally wouldn't play, which basically meant that he was attempting several limitless amount of drop shots that Nadal just kept on reading and nullifying. But it made a kind of fascinating tactical encounter because even though, as I say, it was a straight sets victory and it looked very comfortable on paper, especially if he didn't see the match, I always felt Djokovic was still in the match. Which is remarkable, yeah. especially after the first two sets. No, That's some, how competitive it was. I saw somebody say it was the best six-love, most competitive oh. six-love they've ever seen. Um, Unbelievable. Th to, to, we can talk more about the nuances of that in a minute, but just to get back to the Federer-Nadal rivalry, so the head-to-head the -head stands 24-16 in favour yeah. of Nadal. Yes. Um, and Nadal beat him at 
Wimbledon, which I it, think gives Nadal, you know, we're always searching for made-up criteria here, but your, your, your point is that he, he, Federer's done it on more surfaces, fair enough. Um, but at their peak, it's fair to say, in the darkness that night, that Nadal beat Federer. And in some ways, you just have to let one thing swing it for you. And for me, it, that kind of swings it a little bit. For me, that's like, what, what happened when they met at their peak, um, at one of their peaks, on well, grass? Remember the previous two years at Wimbledon, 2006 and 2007, Federer wiped the floor with Nadal in those two finals. So it was third time lucky for Nadal. So you could argue that Federer is better than Nadal on grass. And I think... Well, you can argue me, that Federer, Federer is better than Nadal on grass. We know that, no doubts. But that's what I'm saying. It's, it's more remarkable for... You know, has, has Federer beaten Nadal on clay? Did he beat him once on clay? Well, he's beaten him in tournaments not at the French Open on clay, but he's never beaten him at the French Open. Nadal has a 100-2 to two winning record at the French Open. The only two matches he's ever lost was to Robin Soderling in 2009 and Novak Djokovic in 2015. So he, Federer's never beaten him at the French. The only time they, Federer's won the French in 2009 against Soderling in the final. But I, I just want to say about that right because it is a good question. It's a very good question about Nadal versus Federer, particularly now that they're on 20 each. I would still argue firmly and strongly that Federer is the better player because you could forget it that in the mid to late 2000s, Federer was playing tennis like that no one had ever seen before. Whereas Nadal is like a human wall. He's impenetrable. He's immovable when he's at peak form, like on Sunday against Djokovic in this final. But Federer's natural talent just drips off him. And in the mid to late 2000s, it was borderline frustrating watching Federer play because he was just too good for everybody else. It was like a talented 15-year-old playing local football against a load of 10-year-olds. That's how good Federer was when he was at his peak. And I don't think that Nadal ever had that ease of victory throughout the peak of his career. And he has had peaks and troughs because it was only a couple of years ago Nadal looked like he was finishing up because of the amount of injuries he had. But he came back and I would say that Nadal's force of will and stamina and sheer bloody mindedness is unparalleled. But nobody comes close to Federer's talent and the fact that he maximised that natural talent. And for me, that's why Federer will always be ahead of Nadal and Djokovic, even if Nadal or Djokovic win more Grand Slams than Federer. I still think Federer is the best of the three. I just wonder, was the quality of opposition that he faced around that period of time that good? You know when you're saying it looked like he was playing against kids? Like, he was, he was beating Andy Roddick and uh, Mark Philip Pousis and, um, you know, in fairness, it was, the, it was the, the dying sting of Agassi's career as well. So there, was, there were definitely some big matches where Agassi was still trying to, to hold in there. But um, I'm not in any way diminishing his career. It's absolutely sensational. It's stunning to watch. It's, like, all-time great. It's just when you're nitpicking, I actually think the case you made for... Nadal coming back is or, uh, the point you make about him being injured is actually strengthening his case for putting him slightly back there. Well, the thing with that argument though about Federer and the opposition he faced is well, what do you want Federer to do about that? Because he 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 beat beat Sampras at Wimbledon. That was that was the moment that he arrived, and Sampras was the defending Wimbledon champion that year, and he beat Andre Agassi in a U.S. Open final had admittedly passed his peak, Agassi. So if you see the list of all-time greatest champions in men's tennis history in the open air in the last 30 years, Federer has generally played against them and he has beaten them. And as it is easy to forget how dominant Federer was 10 to 15 years ago. It's only because in the last decade he has faded away. Because bear in mind he's five and six years older than Nadal and Djokovic respectively. So he played in that... Um, older era and he comes from the, the old guard into the new guard whereas I would say Djokovic is every bit the modern player and is clearly the outstanding player in the world even today even after losing that final is still the best player in the world and Nadal has brought both eras together so Federer does come from that old guard but and has that natural ability that you used to see that casual tennis fans used to see in Sampras and Agassi all the time in these amazing flair players but Federer was able to bring that to a whole new level where 
you would watch him win certain matches and do certain things with that cross court backhand of his or his whipped forehand. And you would just laugh watching TV. I don't laugh watching Nadal. I just puff my cheeks because he never stops running and he almost never misses when he's on form. And to a certain degree, that's what Djokovic does as well. He, Djokovic and Nadal, they don't wow the crowds. Federer does. Is, is Djokovic's win over Nadal, if you said it, he's only lost twice at the French Open, does that not get, open the door a little bit for him if he wins another few Grand Slams for him to claim that GOAT status? Do you not think that that is like the, the one thing, it's kind of mad that we're having this conversation in, in the aftermath of him getting hammered by Nadal on clay, but that is like a really important part of the, of the statistical line. I think Djokovic could statistically be the best set of the three when it's all said and done because he has a year on Nadal, but if you actually study it, he does four Grand Slams a year. Djokovic is now three behind Federer and Nadal. Let's assume Nadal is going to win the French Open next year as well. So that's 21. Djokovic will probably win the Australian Open in January. That's 18. But So he's going to have to play another maybe two or three years at a top level to eclipse Federer and Nadal. So that, that brings him up to his late 30s. So Djokovic, the time is running out for him. But... If anybody can do it, it's Djokovic because he's so much better than everybody else um, on, a, on the ATP tour. Now, Djokovic beat Nadal in 2015, yeah, at the French Open. That was an out of sorts Nadal that has never been seen before. And Djokovic blew him away. But Djokovic lost that final to Stan Wawrinka that year in 2015. Djokovic has only won the French Open once. That was the following year in 2016 against Andy Murray. So at the French Open, there is a massive asterisk next to Federer and Djokovic because they haven't been able to penetrate Nadal's dominance. But I still think that overall, nowadays, in 2020, Djokovic is a better player than Nadal. Oh, yeah. Well, I um, mean, I, I, well, no, 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 no. Today, no. Uh, well, three right days ago, now, four though, days ago, I would have said, yeah, absolutely, it looks that way. But no, you can't. he just got blown away. You can't say he's a better player now. Right this second. I, over, overall, I think he. Overall, I think Djokovic is a better player than Nadal. When you when you take in every surface into account, but not they, at the French. That's what I'm saying at the okay. French. That's why there's an asterisk next to Djokovic and Federer at the French, because they haven't been able to penetrate Nadal. It is a, it is a pity Nadal didn't play in the um, in the U.S. Open, but obviously, you know. But it was smart. It was smart that he didn't. I mean, in retrospect, but there's a possibility that maybe he was uh, he was ready to go for the U.S. Open and ready to go for this. You know, um, these guys keep themselves in good shape. They have they have um, an ability to peak at just the right time. Uh, we should talk about the women's. A sensational uh, the the record for the number of games lost is held by Steffi Graf, I think, from 1988 when she lost 20 games over the course of the entire two weeks. The second best record ever was um, Chris Everts, so back in the early 80s and maybe the late 70s, and uh, our women's champion has equaled that this year. An unheralded unknown yeah. who decided to stay in school until yeah. uh, she was ready to uh, actually had done her equivalent of the leaving cert and then turn pro properly. It's remarkable. She came in, uh, Iga Svantec came into this French Open world number 54. And to be honest, she didn't really come in with any particularly great form. She lost in the first round of the Italian Open, which is the warm-up event um, for the French Open. She was eliminated in the third round of the US Open against the, the eventual finalist, um, Azarenka. And she had never won a WTA title before this uh, French Open. So she wasn't a contender going into this. She was nobody's favourite to win this. And yet she is um, absolutely demolished demolished everybody en route without even coming close to dropping a set. I think the most uh, games that a player took against Svantec in a set was four at this French Open, um, which is really remarkable because you would expect that from someone like Serena Williams in her peak. But this is a 19-year-old, unseeded, um, the first ever Polish tennis player to win a singles Grand Slam title, the youngest French Open winner since Monica Seles in 1992. And she did it with such ease. And she played some serious players in the first round. She beat last year's beaten finalist, Marketa Vandrasova. She beat uh, former Wimbledon finalist, Eugenie Bouchard. She demolished the um, number one seed, Simona Halep, who won the French Open two years ago. And in the final, she beat the reigning, US, or the reigning Australian Open champion, Sophia Kennan. So it wasn't like she played nobodies. 
and she did it with um with this level of dominance that it was Roger Federer like. And the reason that Svantec has stood out so much is that her ground strokes um are hit with this ridiculous spin that players just cannot handle. And her forehand is particularly impressive. Her forehand is by far and away the fastest on the women's side. Uh, it was averaging around 90 kilometers per hour. And um, I think it was only slower than one player on the men's side for the whole tournament. And that was Yannick Sinner. So she's the second fastest forehand in the whole tournament on both sides. And that meant the opposition just could not deal with her. I had one slight concern for her going into the final was that in the quarters and semis, she played the two qualifiers that we discussed last week, uh, Martina Trevisan and Nadia Paderaska. So I thought that she might be a bit rusty against the elite players coming into the final because Kenin beat uh, Petra Kvitova in the semi-final, who's a two-time Wimbledon champion. So I thought Kenin might be more ready for the biggest, uh, the biggest match of the tournament, and especially because Kenin's already played in the Grand Slam final and won that. But no, it wasn't the case at all. Now, the first set between Kenin and Svantec was very competitive, which um, Svantec took 6-4 after serving for the set and having a set point, and Kenan broke her back, and then immediately Svantec broke Kenan back again. But also, just for clarity, the first set of, uh, of that final was the exact same length as the first set of Nadal Djokovic, which was 6-loved. Again, that's how good Nadal Djokovic was. But Svantec um, just outwilled Kenan in that first set, and even though Kenan won the first game of the second set, actually broke Svantec to win that. She didn't win a game again. And Kenan actually went off court for medical treatment for about eight minutes halfway through the second set, which a lot of people claimed to be gamesmanship because she knew the final was getting away from her. And I think she went to maybe clarify her thoughts a bit. But while she was doing that, Svantec was quite remarkable. She put her zip up on. She was uh, mingling with the crowd. She was laughing and joking with them. She was practicing, practicing her serves. She looked every bit uh, a player who was just Ready for uh, strolling to her local court on a Sunday morning, just having a bit of a laugh. And that perspective has really helped her. Like you said, she only just finished up her studies, uh, I think, at the start of lockdown. Right. She still said that she may go back full time to university, uh, even though she's just won the French Open. So that um, the, the down to earthness is really something that people have taken to. And the way that she demolished everyone was, was, was quite astonishing. All right, good stuff, Colm. Thanks very much for that. Colm Boo, giving us some thoughts on the two weeks of the French Open. Uh,